Eric Hawkins. Hawkins coming in this tournament, no buy, someone who was very far up the leaderboard last year on the SCG Tour. This year, he's going to have to start all the way at the bottom and climb himself all the way back up. Same thing we said for Corey McDuffie, but both players off to great starts. They are 8-1 and one here this weekend, and game number one of round 10 about to be underway here from Atlanta. And this is one of the matchups where the combo of Become Immense and Team of Battle Rage, which again, McDuffie does not have, uh, pulls a lot of weight because with four color rallies, best draws, they really gum up the board. There's a lot of token generation, catacomb sifter, elvish visionary type of stuff, and the combo is often your best way of plowing through game states that have become negative for you. Uh, it gets a lot harder to try to win. Even with the Tarkus command and going wide, four color rallies, best draws can easily go wide with you. It might be hard for McDuffie to pull the game out if it stalls out because he doesn't have team or battle range. Hawkins on the play this game started off with a sunken hollow that entered the battlefield tapped. The follow-up was a prairie stream that entered the battlefield tapped and a Sidisi's faithful. No exploit necessary because an 0-4 is pretty good against Zergo. Oh, it's it's much better than an unsummon. Yeah. So that was McDuffie's start. McDuffie with just a mountain into a Zergo. And now he's on his second turn of the game. He's going to start by attacking. I think we're going to see a predictable block here. And this will cause McDuffie to have to use a Wild Slash to get Sidisi's Faithful off the battlefield because he's just got to get that threat out of the way. Exactly. And it saves so much damage. Uh, unfortunately, you know, uh, this is already a pretty good start here for Hawkins, although missing a third land drop is really bad news. If you are able to just block and trade and keep your life total high, make your land drops, uh, your rally is going to be overwhelming in this matchup. And especially here because McDuffie doesn't have Team of Battle Rage or become immense to play over the top of games where Hawkins gums the board up. McDuffie will sacrifice that Bloodstained Mire, fall down to 19, and search up a Cinder Glade. Hawkins' turn, as you mentioned, he missed the land drop, had a Zillaport Cutthroat. And now we're going back Corey's way for his third turn of the game. McDuffie will untap those three permanents, take a draw step here. Very skilled young man is Corey McDuffie, a former Open champion. We've seen him in a handful of Open top eights. A lot of his work has actually been done in the Yu-Gi-Oh card game. Yeah, I believe but he's no slouch here either. I, b I believe, I, I don't know if world champion or, or something, but uh, his pedigree in that game is, uh, is apparently significant. He is a deliberate player as well. Thinking quite a bit on what, what he wants to do each turn. Going to cast a Wild Slash to take care of the cutthroat. There will be a trigger there. Hawkins will gain a little bit of life. Corey will lose a little bit. 21-18 to 18 now. My feeling on this matchup is it is close in terms of percentages, around 50-50. But the games themselves are rarely close. Either Four Color Rally kind of stumbles around early on in the game, doesn't get anything going, and gets run over while they're casting Grey Ogres. Or they're able to block early on in the game, have a Catacomb Sifter on time, a, a Tarka Red quickly can't attack, and then it's just a matter of time for a Collective Company, Grim Horror Specs, or Rally to end the game. Right now, this is shaping up to kind of be a game in the first camp. Even though Hawkins had his opening of Sidisi's Faithful and Zolpor Cutthroat, he's likely to have colored mana issues this game, and that assumes he even makes his land drops, which he missed last turn. Looks like it's going to be a dragon fodder here for McDuffie. Goblin tokens on the way. And now he's starting to go wide a little bit here. Now, of course, for Eric, he's just got to find some lands to get started here. And fortunately, he's, he's built up a little bit of cushion with the Sidisi's Faithful and Zulpor Cutthroat. Even though he's missing land drops, he's only at 19 right now. He's, he's got some time. A Zulpor Cutthroat, no land to play. We're going to head back over to McDuffie. Corey going to come in with all of his creatures. He does have a copy of Become Immense in hand, also a copy of Titan Strength. Graveyard pretty full, too. And this is what you were talking about with Become Immense, where it's still just a good card. It's not very difficult to cast. Exactly. It's, it's very hard for it to not be able to cash in for six damage or clear through their best blocker. And if you aren't able to do that, you are probably losing the game anyway, and it's unlikely some other shock or creature would have made much of a difference. The first one, I would say, just very easy to cast. Kind of just a normal spell in your deck. Yep. Hawkins going to have to decide how he wants to block, or he, truthfully, even if he wants to block. I mean, he is at 19. I think he could maybe rationalize just saying, well, I'll just take all the damage. Yeah, he needs to sort of hope that he's drawing lands and gums up the board. And at that point, I think Zulpor Cutthroat generates too much value for him to be trading with a goblin. It's not like he's going to lose the chance to trade it with a goblin, most likely. Zulpor 
Well, we will find out if blockers have been declared yet, given based off of, excuse me, Corey's actions. And the way he's reaching for mana here, this might be a become immense. Yep. Uh, no blocks here from Eric, so he's basically saying, do your worst, I need this cutthroat around. And Corey says, all right, I will become immense. So two, three, four plus six is 10. Hawkins going to fall down to nine. There's a mountain in the passing of the turn. Eric will draw. Another Zulipur cutthroat in just a passing of the turn. We'll head back Corey McDuffie's way now. He'll draw. Picked up another copy of Fiery Impulse. Two of those in hand along with the Titan Strength. Surprised with the mana up, he did, elected not to kill the Zulipur cutthroat in response to the second Zulipur cutthroat. I'm a touch surprised as well. Curious, what do we see here? Uh, with Hawkins about to gain some life and McDuffie still having a couple shocks in hand, I would probably rather keep the Goblin around rather than deal three damage to Hawkins. So you tighten strength just to keep it around? Yeah, okay. uh, because Hawkins is about to gain a little bit of life. He's not really in burn range right now, and McDuffie's hand is well situated to remove the next couple of threats that Hawkins puts onto the battlefield. So um, the, the extra Goblin will likely connect again and again. And I don't think that Corey wants to see a card like Catacomb Sifter show up. No. You can see McDuffie shaking his head here. I think he made a mistake last turn by just not responding to the second Zulipur Cutthroat by killing the first one. Oh, well, he's going to Titan Strength here on the Zergo. Also, with McDuffie's deck having Reckless Bushwhackers and a Tarkus Command, there's a lot of value to keeping around any sort of creature. The, McDuffie's deck should err on the side of keep my threat in play rather than Lava Spike you if it looks close. Well, top card's going to go to the bottom there from the Scry. And now here's a Fiery Impulse going to go after the Zillipore Cutthroat. So there'll be a trigger there. Hawkins will gain some life. Corey will lose some. Yeah, so this, this costs McDuffie essentially two points of damage, one from the additional trigger, and one because a goblin went blocked instead of unblocked. And now we head back over to Eric. He'll draw a card. Elvish Visionary was the draw. Well, if your opponent never makes a third land drop, doesn't, you know, if you don't sequence everything uh, perfectly, it no, doesn't really matter yeah, all that much. I was going to say the same thing. <laughs> Here's an attack for three. Hawkins is going to fall down to four. McDuffie, no follow-up. He'll just pass the turn back over to Eric. Eric will draw a card. He's just going to pass the turn back yet again. Don't think he's going to make a third land drop this game. McDuffie will draw. I think he has an Abbot, so he will play that. There's a Dragon Fodder. He'll cast that after the attack, you have to imagine. And as Hawkins falls down to one, no card that really can save him in this situation. Two more goblins on the way. Eric will draw. He'll pick up that graveyard, those two lands, and call it a day. Court McDuffie will win game number one here over Eric Hawkins. Atarka Red up a game over Four Color Rally, given Eric's mana problems. But as you said, the games are pretty close as far as percentages are concerned, but they're going to be lopsided. And I think Eric has the ability to make them even more lopsided after sideboard. I think this is, you know, a lot of people think this matchup's great for Atarka Red. I think it's simply fine. Maybe Atarka Red's slightly ahead, but... Um, Rally can definitely have draws that's very hard for a target to compete with, and it usually gets worse after sideboard. Well, let's take a look at the sideboards here. And Eric Hawkins, we will begin. Two Reflector Mage, two Dispel, two Obzon Ascendancy, two Arash and Clares, two Murderous Cut, two Mana Fence of the Foremost, a Duress, a Merciless Executioner, and a Fleshbag Marauder. So the two Dispels, the two copies, a Murderous Cut, the Duress, and the two Arash and Clerics are where I, where I would want to go in this matchup. More cheap interaction, plenty of things to Dispel, plenty of things to Duress, and Murderous Cut. Very powerful, very efficient, especially against a deck playing so many pump spells. There's an argument for bringing in Anna Fenza because a 4-4 four four is just a lot for McDuffie to get through. But if Anna Fenza is a bit of a strain on Hawkins' mana, I would probably leave it in the sideboard. He's got a lot of good options to bring in. On the other side of things here for Corey McDuffie, four Self-Inflicted Wound, three Arc Lightning, two Smoldering Marsh, two P and Kieran Alar, two Painful Truths, and two Den Protectors. The only card that really interests me in McDuffie's sideboard are the two copies of Den Protector, and that's only because of its evasion power. Uh, 
Four Color Rally is very good at locking up the board. But if you have Pump Spells alongside Den Protector, that's a way to punch through in some games. So uh, the rest of this doesn't really do it for me. I, I don't think even with drawing cards or resolving cards like P and Kier and Alar that McDuffie has any sort of edge in the late game. The Den Protectors do help him out if the game happens to go long, uh, but that card to me is more about being an evasive threat rather than some way to hang around with Hawkins in the late game. So no real use for Arc Lightning, you would say here? I, I think that Hawkins has too many threats that uh, you know, if you're killing a Catacomb Sifter for three mana, you know, a lot of his threat, you know, cards like Jace probably get sideboarded out, so I don't think Arc Locking is efficient enough. I do like the Shocks. The Shocks are good plays on curve, kill a lot of stuff, they're good for tempo, but Arc Lightning is just too expensive in my opinion. Well, those are the options there for both players, and as they do sideboard and shuffle up and get ready for game number two, Eric Hawkins will be on the play for that game. We're going to talk about our Season 1 schedule here on the SCG Tour. We started things off in Las Vegas with an Invitational that was won by Caleb Shearer, so that Storm token will be available in Columbus next week and also during that Las Vegas weekend. Brian Brondoon won his first Open after many top eights of Open's Invitationals. He finally got the job done. That's actually why he is in third place on our Season 1 leaderboard. Then, to start off the year, we went to Cincinnati. Bobby Fortinelli got the job done with Amulet Bloom there. In Charlotte, we watched Brian Huffman with Jund get the job done. Now we're here in Atlanta where we'll crown a champion. Columbus again next weekend, and then those regional championships. Yeah, and all the information for regionals is at go.sarcitygames.com slash regionals. You can find the regional championship closest to you first weekend in February. After regionals, we go to Louisville for Modern, a legacy open in Philadelphia, a standard open in Indianapolis, a standard in Baltimore, and then the Season 1 Invitational in Columbus, standard in Modern, as the Invitational formats April 15th through 17th. Of course, for all of those opens that you do attend, you attend that main event, you will get the Kitchen Links play mat. It's adorable, it's fun, and it's easy to get. You sign up, you play, you get one. Pretty simple stuff. Easy stuff. You get it on site for free when you register for any of the two day opens. I'll give you an idea of what's coming for season one. We did announce our season two schedule. We'll go over that today for you as well. But if you can't wait, starcitygames.com, the president of the company, Pete Hoffling, did make that announcement on Friday. For now, however, we learned about the player who will be on the play here for game number two. That's our four color rally player, Eric Hawkins, 31 years old from St. Paul, Minnesota. Two open top eights, a fantastic legacy storm player, finding his way through standard and modern right now, and someone who was the first person out of the Players' Championship last year and has not let that really dissuade him. He said, you know what, I didn't make it last year, but I'm going to make it this year. And it wasn't for lack of effort, and it looked at many times in 2015 like he was going to qualify for the Players' Championship, fell just a little bit short on the back end, and as we saw in 2014, for a player like Danny Jessup who fell a little bit short, often that causes people to redouble their efforts, and Danny was able to get there in 2015. Wouldn't surprise me if Eric was able to get the job done in 2016. He certainly will be trying, that's for sure, and he's off to a great start here this weekend with Four Color Rally, which does feel like at least right now from talking to the big name players in the room the deck to beat in the format well a lot of players felt like it was the best deck in standard at, at the end of last season and hard to argue with the pedigree it had and a winning at grand prix oakland in the hands of reed duke and the fact that it got a substantial addition to the deck and reflector mage not surprising that a lot of players went here week one it's a powerful deck Yes. And that addition with reflector mage is quite good and it is also i think a pretty difficult deck to fight you know, from other decks. It's it just, it's this unique deck that does a lot of different things. It feels like a lot of the times it loses when it kind of stumbles and fumbles on its mana, honestly. And one of the best ways to fight the deck was an offensa, at least game one, and that doesn't work anymore because of Reflector Mage, or at least it's a lot less consistent. I think if you're going to attack Rally, you need to start looking a lot more at spells and a lot less at permanents, particularly creatures, uh, because Reflector Mage just changes the equation so much more duresses, more dispels, more hollow moonlights. And we saw people actually able to execute that successfully. Brad Nelson, Jerry Thompson, they both won matches on camera yesterday where they were leaning on spells to stop Collected Company and Rally Ancestors and using sweepers and removal spells to break up the synergies. So there are recipes out there, but if you're leaning on something like Anafenza plus a clock, that plan is a lot worse than it was a couple weeks ago. Eric Hawkins going to take a look at his opening hand. That, uh, that shoulder shrug doesn't really give me a lot of confidence in that opener. Well, there's a lot of hands that Rally gets where, yeah, I kind of need to draw out of it a little bit. Maybe I'm missing a color of mana or some such. And usually you can just keep those hands. This is one of the matchups where you can't. McDuffie with just a mountain in the passing of the turn. We're going to head back Eric's way, it looks like. He'll sacrifice a windswept heath. A Forester of Plains on the way, and now there is Aleel, the Eternal Pilgrim. This is a problematic card for a Tarka Red. 
Uh, not easy to get through this with pump spells because of death touch. Three toughness means it's very hard to kill early on in the game. You basically need to get to spell mastery with fiery impulse. So usually that takes a couple of turns. And it sacrifices things to gain life. So a lot going on here. Very powerful for the matchup. A dragon fodder here for McDuffie. Two 1-1 one, one goblins. And he will just pass the turn back over to Hawkins here. There are times, there are draws you get, where Air of the Wilds, for example, is a very problematic card. And the difference between two and three toughness for this deck is significant. So uh, if you want to improve your matchup against a Tarka Rat, this is a great place to go. A lot of relevant text on this card. That's for sure. Corey McDuffie, the 2014 Yu-Gi-Oh! National Champion. So we talked about his pedigree in that game. Very skilled in that area. But again, skilled in this one as well as he's currently up a game. Though Hawkins draw this game much better than the previous one. Though it looks quite land heavy. Uh, I don't think he has any of his payoff cards right now, and he has a lot of lands in hand. So uh, by the looks of things on the table, his draw is very solid, but I think the reality might be worse than that. Well, all it takes is one collected company. Yes. And that can really turn a game around. You might have something like a Catacomb Sifter on the way. There are a lot of cards that can just kind of gum up the works, and it looks like Eric might just be coming into the red zone here. Feeling pretty confident about his board position right now, that's for sure. McDuffie will take two. No good blocks to be had here for Corey. And now there is Reflector Mage. Another three toughness threat. Yep. When you're curving out with things like Jace and Grim Horror Specs, often the Tarka Red will swallow you up just with a curve of creatures and shocks. When you're deploying three toughest creatures onto the battlefield, way harder to do that. Reflector Mage, a great new addition to this deck. Good across multiple matchups. Hawkins starting to playing two more in his sideboard. Here's a Horling Outburst for McDuffie. Three more goblins on the way. He's got four total. No good attacks to be had, however. So he will just pass the turn back over to Eric. Eric's fourth turn of the game. You mentioned his hand is a little bit land heavy. He just picked up another one there in an island. And perhaps this is why we saw the shoulder shrug at his keep. Not in love with what he has here. And his draws don't appear to be cooperating just yet either. It looks like his hand right now, we don't have the best glimpse of it, but it appears to be four lands and a Zulaport cutthroat. He's going to start by sacrificing a flooded strand. If I'm sitting in McDuffie's seat right now, I'm thinking I'm getting clobbered. Yeah. Uh, this game's going really poorly, but uh, the reality might not be quite that bad. Yeah, there are games of Magic that you do play where you feel like you're getting clobbered and then you end up winning and at the end of it you're just like, you have nothing? And they're yep. like, yeah, I, I don't have anything. Oh, there is Lillipore Cutthroat. And you mentioned three lands in hand for Eric Hawkins, it appears. So over to Corey McDuffie we'll go. And Abbott at Carroll Keep was the draw. And it looks like he's got multiple copies of that in hand. At least for McDuffie, he has gotten two spells in the graveyard, so fiery impulses are, are big draws for him right now. It looks like he'll start with the Abbot. Take a look at the top, a dragon fodder. Perhaps more goblins on the way. Well, you can see McDuffie's hand, I believe, has a Tarkas command in it, so he's setting himself up to go wide. Yep. And this going wide approach appears to be a pretty good one here in this matchup. And just for Corey this week, an 8 1 record with this go wide approach of a Tarka Red instead of going over the top with Teamer Battle Rage and Become Immense. Well, this is the type of game where you kind of want Become Immense and Teamer Battle Rage because the board's getting gummed up, and even going wide with the Tarka's command might leave him a little bit short. A swamp the draw for Eric. He'll start by playing a Windswept Teeth. Problem is that the Tarkas command with a bunch of 1-1s one -one still isn't that great against two threes. Yeah. Numbers don't quite line up. If he's able to find something like another copy of a Tarkas command or a Reckless Bushwhacker, that changes quite a bit. Then his Alpha Strike becomes great. And McDuffie like does have another copy of Abbot of Carol Keep in hand. So he could be thinking about doing that. And you also have to think about, there's so many implications right now. We know Hawkins' hand is nothing, but right now McDuffie has to respect the possibility of Collected Company. He has to respect the possibility of Dispel. There's a P in Kieran Nalar. Not going to get to be able to play that one. 
Always a little frustrating when you turn over a card that you don't get to play. I mean, you bring in four mana spells in your 22 land deck, your habit's going to get a little worse. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> you did it to yourself. Bloodstained Mire the land for the turn. And Duffy does have an Atarkness command in hand, another copy of Abbot of Carol Keep as well, perhaps for next turn. And he will just pass the turn. You see McDuffie setting up just a huge alpha strike. Mm -hmm. That involves a target command or the Reckless Bushwhacker, some combination of those cards. And Hawkins, well, again, we know he's got all lands in his hand. Corey does not. Though Corey might be able to start deducing that he has nothing, or at least not as strong as he's trying to appear. Well, if Hawkins doesn't do anything right now, I'm taking Collected Company off the table. This would be a fine spot to cast him. Yep. I still think there is a possibility that Dispel and or Murder is cut in his hands, so I still have to worry about that. Well, let's see if Eric can draw something of relevance this turn. Ah, Swamp. Nice. He'll but, play a Canopy Vista and pass. But so much of what Hawkins does occurs on his main phase. Mm -hmm. The deck's got a lot of creatures in it. So when Hawkins isn't doing anything, you got to start deducing that his hand's a little land heavy. Again, Dispel and Murderous Cut could easily be in his hand, but creatures he would have cast, he could also have Rally in his hand because he hasn't really had an opportunity to do anything with that. Yep. I think that's the other one, too. Uh, you know, Corey could assume, hey, maybe he's gummed up on some rallies and he's got no graveyard and his deck just hasn't really been functioning very well. If I'm Corey in this spot, I I'm with you. I think I'm taking him off a of collective company. Yep. Although with, with McDuffie having the sideboarded Smoldering Marshes here, I think he probably went up to the 24 land build. Probably brought in copies of Painful Truths as well. Okay. Not the way that I would approach the matchup, but I, I understand the reasoning. Duffy looking at, I believe, a copy of Fiery Impulse in hand right now. But he will start with an Abbot. Spin the wheel. A mountain. He'll get to play that mountain. And again, I just feel like he's at the stage right now where he just doesn't have a great attack because he's probably trying to play around some other things. Again, we know that Hawkins has nothing, but Corey doesn't know that, so he's going to play at least a little bit cautious. Well, this is a play, and I think McDuffie should have done it on camera when we had him uh, in one spot against Shearer. You can play a target's command pre-combat. You don't have to wait for blocks. If Hawkins has to spell, he's going to spell it, and if he doesn't, then you can safely attack. But if you're worried about your Alpha Strike getting blown up by Dispel, you can just cast the Atarkas Command first. It's very true. Fire Impulse is going to go after the Eternal Pilgrim. And that's going to resolve. Now with your Abbots being three tubes because of the Fire Impulses, you probably don't care that much about your Atarkas Command getting Dispel because your Abbots will still be four threes and no trades can occur on the table. Looks like huh? the way Eric's reaching for those lands in his graveyard. It looks like he might be thinking concession. I'm not sure. It looks like they're clarifying life totals here. A little early for a concession. Well, Eric has all lands, so <laughs> yeah, but might be thinking about it. First I of mean, all, I agree with you. First of all, McDuffie doesn't know that. Second of all, the right collected company off the top can totally flip this game around. Also true. Here come the beatdowns. Corey's making his move. So target's command is three plus nine damage at the minimum, because there's six unblocked creatures plus three damage going to the head. So that's nine. And then those abbots are, I don't know if there's a way out of this one. No, I guess it, I, I, if Hawkins double chump blocks the abbots, I think he gets out of this turn. Yeah, he gets out of this turn alive if he does that. Yeah. Then the question becomes what he's drawing to. I suppose Rally at that point is is, is, is out. Rally's, a, Rally's an okay draw. You don't love it, but it's, it, I think it's the best thing that he can draw. It would get back Eile, along with Reflective Mage, which would bounce a token. Angela Port Cutthroat. Sacked to gain some life. Yep. You, you know, you'd probably get one more turn that way. He could, he could hang around a little bit. McDuffie has uh, predicted correctly that Eric's hand is not particularly strong, and it's time to get in with these creatures. Well, he's, it's running out of things it could be. At this point, it's, it's really just Rally. It could still be Murderous Cut. 
but you don't really care that much about murderous cut. You're not in a position where you're blown out by it. You'd prefer for him not to have it, but if he's looking at double chump blocking your abbots, you can probably take him off of that card too. Mm -hmm. His actions kind of inform your decisions. Yeah. Hawkins does not have the body language of a person right now with a dispel or really any interaction at all. It is notable. Now, perhaps Corey does not have an Atarkus Command in hand, but not making a move at all there. I, I think McDuffie does have it in hand, but the logic is if he's got nothing, who cares? And if he's got something, I'd rather just wait because maybe the board gets gummed up down the road. There's a swamp. The draw for Eric this turn was a Reflector Mage. Also, I've occasionally seen, I, I can't recall the name of the card, but I have occasionally played against rally decks that have the exploit minus one, minus one to your opposing, opposing guys. So if you Atarkas command short of lethal and then Hawkins draws that, you get wrath and now you're dead. I believe Minister of Pain. That sounds right, yeah. So maybe he's playing around that as well. I know this because I did not play around this at one point, and then I learned my lesson. Mm. And it only takes once yes. to learn that lesson. But if you keep the Atarkas command back, you save everything on tap and attack again. Yep. Well, McDuffie's going to move to his turn, tapping mana right away. Arc Lightning. Three to the Reflector Mage. Here come the attackers. Yeah, this is lethal on the table, even if he blocks a Abbott. Yep. Eric's going to show us two lands, and that is going to do it. Corey McDuffie's going to win this match over Eric Hawkins. Two games to zero. Atarka Red going to take care of four-color rallying for McDuffie. Nine and one here in Atlanta.